أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى لسنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers الحمد لله we are starting a new series today because we have finished on Sunday actually morning after morning we always do kind of biography we started with the the life of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم we did it for almost two two and a half years. And then we started uh, the, the stories of four young Sahaba, the four Abdullahs, that we finished just before Ramadan. So today, inshallah, with the same trend, we're going to start a new series. And I believe that this is going to be very interesting. So I think the brothers will be keep their eyes open, inshallah. Uh, and uh, because this is the series will be related to our daily lives, you know. Because the previous one, especially the, the four Abadillahs, uh, they are also very important Sahabas. We learned a lot from them, from their life story. But this series that, that, that I'm trying to do, uh, it will have implication of our understanding in our daily, daily ibadah, inshallah ta'ala. So that the new series will be the series about the four Imams. The four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. So we'll talk about them. Uh, they are mainly about their life stories. Uh, and when you talk about their life story, we'll talk about how they used to understand uh, the, the science of the hadith, the science of the fiqh, because they are the giants of the fiqh. And you know, what were their lifestyle, you know, how are they affected uh, on their opinions and everything. And with this one, we'll understand why there are differences of opinion, you know, and, uh, and in different, in, in different uh, aspects of the ibadah, why some must have said this way, some must have said this way, you know, there must be something that, you know, we are missing out, you know, why there will be differences between the imams, although they are almost in the, the contemporary time. So they are not like far from each other. They are probably, you know, same lifetime, you can say, almost the same lifetime in, in their lifetime. So also another part of this talk will be that these four people, we know them as an imam. And when you say the word imam, we think imam in our life. So like, you know, imam Sheikh Yusuf or Sheikh Aslam, you know, they come, they give us religious fatwas or, you know, solutions, they lead the prayer, they lead the salah, the khutbah, that's it. But these four people are not like that. They are titled as imam, but they are very, very strong political figures. And when you know about that part, you'll be surprised, you know. They were, they are very, very political figure of that time. You know, just like if you talk about any, any MPs of today, or not even MP, like any opposition minister, or, you know, a, a big, you know, president that is retired or something. So just a, like a huge political figure. And that's why the government is to work with them you know, very closely. And that's why you will see in their life, you know, how they put their opinion, because the government was Islamic government at that time, and where they live. So these things uh, will give us a proper understanding that how come this mother say this and this mother doesn't say this one. So in, inshallah ta'ala, we'll have, we have the introduction today. Uh, before we start, uh, obviously we're gonna start with Imam Abu Hanifa. Uh, I put a small map there. This is the map of Iraq of that time, actually. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the Makkah is south to that. Obviously, Makkah and Madinah, the south there, is south to that. The, the main place I want to point out is Kufa. So Imam Habu so we need to understand the situation of Kufa first, and then we'll go slowly, slowly with the life of Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa. So today's topic, in, in, because then I'm trying to keep it as short as possible, maybe 15 minutes maximum to 20 minutes, you know, uh, and then that's why I'm gonna go, I break the, break the series in a small part. So we just have the introduction today and just the birth of Imam Abu Hanifa. But before this, but what was the situation of Islam at that time? And this is actually just after, just <coughs> after the four Abadilas that we talked about. Just after the four Abadilas we talked about. If you remember, when is all the Abadilas passed away? Which Hijri year, all the Abadilas passed away? I mentioned it a few times. Anybody remember? 73. Hijri 73, all of the Abadilas, all of the fitna has been done, uh, you know, meaning, you know, the fitna of Karbala, obviously. You can see the Karbala is very close to Kufa. So Kufa is such a place, you know, see, the Karbala, Kufa, and Basra. These are the main three cities. Karbala is famous because of, because of what happened there, as you all know that. And Kufa, uh, we'll talk about it more, and then we have the city of Basra. So the other part of the Iraq, and Baghdad and other part, those are not that much affected at that time. But these are the main city life of there. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the opinions about the city, what the other people said at that time. So 
Hijri 73, all the Aba leaders passed away, but there is still there are some Sahabas living at that time. And uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, that will, will end the talk today with uh, his birth year, he, he is born on 76 Hijra. So three years after that, after all the Abadilas, all the four Abadilas passed away, and still there are other Sahabas living there. So the city of Kufa, uh, from the time of Sahaba, you know, obviously in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it is not under the, under the Muslim rule. So in the time of Omar ibn al-Khattab, it has been conquered, and the Muslim army had a policy at that time. And it was the mainly policy of the Khalifa, you know, Amir al-Mu'min Umar ibn al-Khattab, that you know, when you go to conquer a city, you place your camp, the army camp, not inside the main city. You will be outside of the city. So that's like a controlling camp. From there, you will go to city. If you need to fight there, you come back. If you need to establish something there, if you, if you win the, if you conquer the land, you go there, you establish masajid, you know, all the things. But your camp is still outside because Omar, and the, the, the reason behind this policy is Omar ibn Khattab doesn't want to go and you know, show people that you know, I'm going for the, the money of this city or the, the, the big palaces of the city. Our job is to establish the, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they stay in a smaller place and they control the big city. And if you go through the history of Islam in any city, you know, when the Islam went to Egypt, you know, Morocco, in Algeria, all these places, they always camp outside the city. That city was the Kufa. Okay? So when it's been conquered, uh, the people of Iraq is always a trouble, and since today you know, it's, it's always a trouble, meaning they are not satisfied with the rulers, basically. So the first governor that Omar ibn Khattab, I'm, I'm going very fast, you know, not going through the stories of the Sahabas, he sent Saad ibn Abi Waqqas. Saad ibn Abi Waqqas was one of the ten promised parallels, a very, very famous Sahaba. You know, he, he is like one of the first ten Sahaba when he accepted Islam. Not for us, ten of you, one of the first five or six Sahaba, you can say. And just before Abdullah ibn Masud. Saad ibn Abu Akkas went there and he stayed there as a governor, but people start complaining about him. Imagine, they're complaining about a Sahaba. And Saad ibn Abu Akkas was been complaining so heavily that Omar ibn Khattab has to call him and ask him, and he verified that the Saad ibn Abu is completely out of all these allegations. He has nothing to do with this, he's completely innocent. But Saad ibn Abu Akkas, Abu Akkas, he left it. He said, no, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to be governor. Then he said, yes, you know, Ammar ibn Yasir. You all know who is Ammar ibn Yasir. He was another famous Sahaba. He also couldn't do it for too long. Then he said, you know, after that, Abdullah ibn Masood, as we talked about in the Abadila, Abdullah ibn Masood, he went there as a governor. The best thing he did, he made the city a city of the Quran. So he made the learning of Quran very much. And it is so prominent, you know, by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has this authority in the Quran. So he spread the Quranic learning very much in the city of the Kufa. And that's why the, out of the 10 Kira, the 5 Kira is, if you look at the resource, when you became a half, you have to take Izaja. So where is this Izaja coming from? It all comes from, from Kufa. 5 out of the 10, 5 comes from the Kufa, the city of Kufa. So this is called the Madinatul Quran, the city of Quran, the Kufa. But even after that, you know, he has to also go away. And then Usman ibn Affan came, uh, you know, Umar ibn Khattab passed away, Usman ibn Affan came. At that time also it was very, very turmoil. You know, Mughira ibn Shwe had been sent there and he couldn't also control it that way. So it's always a problem. And then when Ali Radizana became, after the fitna of Usman Radizana, when Usman Radizana was killed in the masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, the fitna broke out, as you all know. And people of Kufa, basically, that time, they have already gone to Medina and taken over Medina. So now, this is, this is the reason uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he moved his capital to Kufa. So for, so for the first time, from Medina, it went to Kufa. And as you all know, that you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib also got killed in the Masjid of Kufa by the Khawarij. By the Khawarij. I'll talk about the Khawarij a little bit today. So, he got killed and after that also you know that you know, only for a few years you know, Hassan, you know, <coughs> Hassan you know, the grandson of Hassan was, was the Khalifa in this side and in Sham there's Muawiyah and then Muawiyah established his, his dynasty, the Umayyad dynasty in Sham, in, in Syria and they always try to keep the people of Kufa happy, keep changing the governor after governor. And why this is happening because and because the Kufa had all these changes, all this fitna, different type of people from different places they came to the Kufa with their different theology. So initially it was all political. The Shia that we talk about today, it was completely a political 
political position of one group of people. Nothing to do with you know, the Salah, the Quran, and anything. It is completely political that they are the supporters of Ali, basically. So there are three groups being created at that time, after the death of uh, Ali Zadan, the Alawis. Now the Alawis, when I say Alawis, there are two types of Alawis. The current days Alawis and that time Alawis. Alawis of that time means people who were supporters of Ali. Because Ali was killed in the Masjid of Kufa, and you know, people rebelled against him. They wanted to support the Ali. They wanted to support the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because that group couldn't do much <coughs> at that time, because of Umayyad dynasty and you know, all this fitna happened, so they couldn't be you know, that prominent at that time. But then another group came up, uh, al Abbasia. Abbasi are the group of the, the another cousin of Rasulullah Islam, Abdul ibn Abbas. So his progeny became al Abbasiyas. And also the Khawariz. Khawariz is the other group who is to you know make takfir of other people, meaning saying, you know, you are kafir, you are kafir, you know, if you make a simple sin, and they used to kill the people. So these are the three groups that have been created, and our Alawis and Abbasiyas were supporter of each other, but you know, they also couldn't establish that many things over, over there. Now the current days Alawis that we talk, they are one group of Shia, the extreme group of Shia, you know, the family of Basar al-Assad, uh, the Syria, Syrian government, they are from Alawis now, and they are extreme in this sense, their belief is completely changed, because slowly, slowly, when they have the different group, the Khawaris from a different group, the Alawis from a different group, some people came with new theology, meaning the new type of belief, okay, and they start fabricating a lot of hadiths. The Kufa is a place of fabrication. So a lot of fabricated hadith. They said, this Rasulullah said, this person will come. He will have a dot in his hand. And then if you see him, kill him. So they used to make his own photo. They used to make lie after lie just to, you know, save their own interest. Okay? So this Alawis, that the current days Alawis, they also believe, if you, if, you, if, you, if you study their theology now, they believe, you'll be surprised to know, that Jibreel alayhi salam made a mistake. Astaghfirullah. He made a mistake to bring the Iqra Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalaf to Rasulullah Sallam. He was supposed to take it to Ali. So that is their belief, you know. The Alawis. Even, even now, you know, if, if, if you read their theology, this is what they believe, okay. So Ali is there. And one kind of, one kind of Alawis believe that, you know, just like Christian believe, that you know, Ali is the incarnation of God. Astaghfirullah, you know, like he is another form of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So anyway, so these are the three groups at that time has been right. Uh, the next thing, the three school of fiqh at that time. So in this turmoil situation, so I'm telling you this because you should understand that when a person is born in such a city at such a time, what's going to happen? So there are three school of thought. So before the Mazhab, Hanafi, Shafi, you know, Maliki, there were three school of thought. One is called Ahlul Hadith. Ahlul Hadith, uh, these are the Imam of the Ahlul Hadith at that time, like Imam, Imam Malik been born after, uh, after Imam Habib, Abu Hanifa, but he was also a follower of Hadith. So if this, uh, you know, the Allah Ibn Saad, uh, as you can see the name, he was in Egypt, you know, al awzai is in like close to Lebanon, okay, uh, basically uh, uh, in, 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 in the area of Lebanon at that time, or Sham. Hassan al-Basri, near the city of Basra, in the city called Hassan al-Basri, they're all even Syrian, they're all great Sahaba, as not Sahaba, so Tabi, and, and, uh, and, and as you can say, Imam Malik is not considered a Tabi, but you know, very close to them. So these people, they used to believe in Hadith. So if they get a Hadith from Prophet Islam, if someone said, I have heard this, and they have, you know, have authenticity, they believe and they follow this. If a situation comes where it didn't happen in the time of Rasulullah Islam, they stop there. They say, no, we're not going to place any fatwa because I don't have any hadith on that. Okay? But the Ahlu Rai, Ahlu Rai, Rai means logical thinking, reasoning. Okay? These are the group from the Kufa. Okay? These people say, because uh, these scholars basically in Kufa, they said, we cannot take all the hadith because people who are getting hadith from, they are fabricating. We can trust anyone in our city that can come and give us hadith. And it is very hard to believe for them. It is very hard to authenticate for them. And also, because Kufa became a city, basically, the Medina, Egypt, Sham, is still considered as not city. They are like, as you can say, rural area. So they have a masjid, they have all the Sahabas, the you know, Sahabas' sons, grandsons there. They're just following the Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Kufa, why is called city? Because different peoples come from different sides. Even the theology of Greek came there. 
You know, the people from the Greece, they came. People from Persian, they came. And Persian, as, a, as you all know, that that side was the Persian, Persian government, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, even from the Khurasan and all these people, they have different kind of theory. They used to worship the, uh, the fire and other things. So they want to incorporate all these things into Islam. They bring new things in Islam, okay? So that's why the Ahlu Rai, the, these people say, no, we are not going to take Hadith. Also, we have new situation arise. This situation never happened in the Prophet Islam. We have no hadith. So they used to do logical thinking and especially qiyas, as we call that qiyas. Qiyas is one of the methodology. So they used to say, okay, Rasulullah s.a.w. said this is, can happen. So this is very similar situation. So we can implement this hadith to this hadith. And you know, I will give you some example when I go in details, inshallah. Ta'ala. So uh, for example, i uh, give you one example now. That Rasulullah said that, you know, that the hadith, when you tell someone to make a boat, so someone is making a boat for you, you give the money before he starts making the boat. But then, you know, there are clothes and other things you have to make from your tailor, right? So, and it takes time to make them. So do you really need to give the money beforehand? Because you need to check. You know, you, you, you take your measurement, if you make a wrong thing, why are you going to spend your money on that? So, and so they, they, they key us that one with here, and they said no. Because he said this one, for the boat, to make a boat, we should do the same thing for making clothes. So. There, this kind of small things and a lot of other issues we'll, we'll talk about inshallah ta'ala later on that they make logical reasoning instead of taking a, a proper hadith. So they just used to make kiyas. And also there's another group called Zahiriya. Zahiriya is the completely opposite of the logical group. They say, no, we're not going to check the authenticity of the hadith. We're not going to do reasoning. Whatever says in the word by word, we'll follow it. So they just go literalist, as you can say in English, literalist. So whatever the ayah say, doesn't matter what context is there. You know, is there a story behind this ayah? Is there a story behind this hadith? They said, we don't care. It says this, we follow this. So that is the, that is the, 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 the policy of the Az-Zahiriya. <coughs> now let's go. So this is the situation of the Kufa at that time. And in this time, the, the Abu Hanifa born in, the, in this turmoil of the, of the Kufa. And Professor Islam had the hadith and the scholars uh, say that this hadith has an indication of the coming of Abu Hanifa, and this hadith actually is in Bukhari. What basically Rasulullah said that one day he was sitting <coughs> with his Sahaba and he was explaining to them Suratul Juma. Suratul Juma. And in Suratul Juma, uh, there's an ayah, meaning, and they will come and join after with them. So Allah is talking about the Ya Yuhaladin Amanu, the people who believe us. So in the ayah Allah says, there are people who will come and join the believer. Will come and join the believer. So Sahaba asked, who are these people they will come later and join the join the believer? So Rasulam didn't answer at that time. So another Sahaba says, Yeah, so tell us who are these people? They will come later on and join. Because we think we are the Muslim only, we are the Sahaba. So Salman and Farisi came at that time. And Prophet Islam said, at that time, these people means if the knowledge is in the star, meaning knowledge has lifted out and went to the sky. Basically, knowledge is far to reach. Even if it's both is reached, the progeny of Salman al-Farisi will touch the star. Meaning, the people from the Farsi, you know, the, the Persian, as you have said, because you all know that Salman al-Farisi is the Farsi. So, his progeny, his people will be the people who will be touching the knowledge. Okay? And, as you all know, Imam Abu Hanifa is not an Arab. So this is the first thing you should know. Imam Abu Hanifa is not an Arab. His father was his father was Sabit ibn Zuta ibn Marzuban. Look at the name. Can anybody guess which country he could be from our time? Sabit ibn Zuta ibn Marzuban. Any guess? So this is his father and his grandfather. So Zuta was his father and Marzuban was his grandfather. They were basically from Khorasan, the Afghanistan. So they are Afghani. So his father, his father is Afghani. And Marjuban, his grandfather, he came to Kufa and he was a servant, as you can say, or like a, uh, like a khadim of Ali al-Quran. So when Ali has the capital there, so Marjuban is uh, like, and you know, Ali al made a dua for Marjuban and his progeny that, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, bless you with the, with the blessings and everything. And scholars later on said that dua obviously you know take effect. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a great scholar, Imam Abu Hanifa. So he was born at 
you have 699CE, so 76AH. So the Hijri 76, so the death of Rasulullah Islam after 66 years he was born and he lived up to 144 AH, which is uh, probably, uh, I think, 67 years, he, he, 68 years, he lived there. And then he grew up in the city of the Kufa. Inshallah, uh, today we will finish it here because it's a bit too much for everyone to grasp. Uh, next week, we'll start from his life. So he, today we just talk to you the, 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 the city of the Kufa and then how the situation of this one. And obviously, you can understand he will be one of the person, one of the scholar of Ahlul Rai, because he is in Kufa, so he has to do a lot of logical uh, and reasoning, and, and you know, and that's why he's called the, the great scholar of Ahlul Rai, the, 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 the scholar of the of the Rai people. So we'll finish it here. Jazakallah khairan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shabbat Allahi Hamd. Astaghfiruka.